group of researchers couldn't be more different. These hunters got their education living off the land in Canada's far north. These scientists got their education at universities in southern Canada and Europe. But in a picture increasingly common across Canada's north, these two groups are joining forces, merging Inuit knowledge. Now I'm starting to see more diseased muskox from way back then. With science and technology. There we go, got the site marked, and we're good. To better understand climate change's radical transformation of the Arctic. The relationship between science and indigenous knowledge hasn't always been so easy. In the past, Inuit say scientists would often do research in the Arctic and then just leave. Community members say they were seldom told about research findings or how they might impact their lives. Inuit knowledge of the land and animals was rarely acknowledged, if it was even used at all. Bobby Greenlee heads the Hunters and Trappers organization in Cambridge Bay, Nunavut. Traditional knowledge is probably one of the best things for everybody to come up here, when they do come up here. Get that, and then it's a good starting point for, for everybody, instead of just, okay, we're here, we're gonna go out there. Well, you can't do that. Government and the scientists are starting to listen to our request for them to share our you know, experience and our knowledge of you know wildlife and the waters and the land and so it's you know it's it will be a good benefit for both scientists applying for grants or research permits in parts of Canada's north are increasingly required to show how communities will be involved in their work and how results will be reported back to northerners but bobby greenlee says barriers still remain no matter how well intentioned people are he says the Muskox Health Monitoring Program, a partnership between Cambridge Bay and the University of Calgary, is an example of what can happen when the two groups work hand in hand. Thank you very much for having us. It's really, it's nice to be here and it's, it's a great group of people. Not too often that this happens, we, we have to mug everybody usually to It's nice that you're just coming forward and saying, we've got this, it's our land. And, yeah. We try to keep stuff healthy, and that's what we're working for, is to, so our kids and grandkids and everybody can continue on with our lifestyle. Yeah. And without this kind of stuff, it, we never know. It, it might not be there if we don't start looking after it. Hunters around Cambridge Bay say that musk oxen, an animal important to their culture and economy, have been getting skinnier, sicker, and further away from the community over the last decade. There's also been an unusually high number of muskox deaths on Victoria and Banks Islands. I, our family go out on the land and harvest our own food, and we've noticed uh, the health of our animals changing over time, and it's been of a concern. The monitoring program was set up in 2010 to better understand the impact of climate change on these animals. From the start, the scientists sought to include everyone in the community, from subsistence hunters to the local outfitters. Our scientific presence has not been that long, but the knowledge in the community, the people who are out on the land, are the ones who have seen more musk oxen than I ever will see in my lifetime. They've handled more muskox, and they've got knowledge that's been passed down over generations. Scientists provide the Hunters and Trappers Association and the local outfitter with these kits for the muskox and they harvest. With it, the hunters gather fur samples. When we get the fur, we want to get it with as little blood as possible because the blood will contaminate the, oh, yeah. um, the hormone assays. So once you get it, hold it in on itself. blood and fecal matter. This is a good case for us because we can work everything up. Okay. The hunters then bring the samples back to Matilda Tomaselli, a PhD student at the University of Calgary. Did you find anything strange on the animal? Any scabs or... Eh? No fat. No fat, eh? Yeah. 
Both of them? Yeah. Okay. The kits are then processed to evaluate the animal's health and identify diseases. But it's not just these kits that are making a difference. The hunters' observations and their historical knowledge of the land and animals are pushing scientific research into important new areas. You see muskox going across to the mainland. Really? There's island muskox going, they're migrating across to the mainland. Oh. I don't know why. The last couple of years I've seen that. I've never known muskox to migrate across, but that was the first year I actually witnessed Wow. What I learned from the hunters very much forms my research. It allows me to move forward and to generate some new hypotheses and to, to formulate those hypotheses. I can probe with the hunters what they're seeing and then think, okay, what may this mean from a scientific perspective? But capturing that knowledge isn't always easy. Matilda Tomaselli is in charge of the hunter interviews in Cambridge Bay. Working with a translator, she uses drawings so hunters can point out the kinds of changes they're seeing in muskox health. As for the rest, it's done with this. Beans. Researchers ask local hunters to divide the beans and show how their observations now compare to the past. Interviews actually are a very important tool in the program and in my PhD study because they provide the basis of uh, uh, knowledge that otherwise get missing with the traditional way of uh, conducting monitoring and surveillance only with the samples, for example. The interviews and sample kit collection is something many local hunters have embraced. When we heard of this research happening in regards to the muskox, that's when we decided we need to be part of this so we can be able to answer some of the questions that we have in regards to what we're finding. I know with research and science, if we can make a difference in how the health of our animals and our food, if we can help that by taking part in this research, it's all the better, not only for today, but for our animals, for our children and our grandchildren. To continue to harvest a healthy animal. Well, I'm very, very thankful that um, I got the opportunity to uh, take out the biologist and learn more from her. She told us that she learned a lot from you. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, we learn from each other. Researchers here say it's important to highlight how key Inuit knowledge is to understanding not only how climate change is affecting the Arctic, but also how it's affecting the rest of the world. The more we can take that and use it as a bit of a model for other systems to understand, you know, how, what's going to happen with malaria, what's going to happen with a number of human diseases or livestock diseases. So this provides a bit of a, a pristine model for doing some of that work. And it's an important acknowledgement that is not always uh, done by researchers. Ultimately, what we strive to do is develop a system where we can have ongoing monitoring of muskox health that incorporates these different bodies of knowledge and integrates them. It's not this is one, this is the other, and they're two different bodies, but they, they are together. As for the Cambridge Bay Hunters, they want to encourage other Arctic communities to get involved in scientific research. If people can take part in um, some of the research that's happening, but also request that research happens when they see changes, start connecting, start dialoguing. With the types of interviews that Matilda's been doing, I think that's where we get, we get a lot more information with those two together. To my team. Some of my words finally got into somebody's ears and I think we're gonna start doing something. For well, you know it what we can do now might just save what we have in the future for our children. <laughs>